This video was sponsored by CuriosityStream, in partnership with my streaming service, Nebula. Hey, happy Friday. This week, Nvidia made their graphics cards compatible with ARM chips from MediaTek. We got some promising news for Android smartwatches and some new right to repair rules were passed in the US. Our quiz this week requires you to identify 20 smartphone classics from their photos. See how many of them you can get right. Links are in the description and welcome to the Friday checkout. <music> Okay, my release highlights this week start with the Realme GT Master Edition, which has a funky suitcase inspired rear cover designed by Japanese retailer Muji, and I think it looks absolutely fantastic. Finally, something other than glass. Then my personal favorite new release was a Louis Vuitton Bluetooth speaker that is about as ugly as a speaker can possibly get. The company calls it a multi-sensory experience because it has RGB lights and it costs $2,890. Cool, cool. Yeah, that makes total sense. And finally, the community favorite of the week was the OnePlus Nord 2. And I can definitely see why. I've played with it for a few minutes and at 400 euros, this phone feels almost as good as the twice as expensive OnePlus 9. I'm happy OnePlus hasn't given up on providing value completely just yet. As always, to see all of the new releases and their details, go to the crowd app and upvote your favorites to let them rise to the top and to let me know which ones to pick next week. Okay, my first story of the week will be Nvidia making their graphics cards and fancy gaming tech like RTX compatible with ARM processors and Linux, showing off a demo at least of playing games like Wolfenstein Youngblood on a GTX 3060 and a MediaTek processor called the Companio 1200. The demo screen capture shows a version of Arch Linux in the background, so I suppose that's the software that they actually used, but MediaTek's website refers to the Companio specifically as a processor made for Chromebooks and since those run on a modified version of Linux as well, I wouldn't be surprised if this setup could technically support Chrome OS in the future too, and since Nvidia specifically said that their tech would work on ARM in general, I wouldn't be surprised if other chips like those from Snapdragon powering Windows PCs would be supported in the future as well. Of course this was just a demo so far, plus most games aren't really optimized for neither Linux nor ARM at the moment, so I wouldn't expect masses of gamers switching to Chrome OS any time soon, but the implications here are quite interesting. ARM processors on both Windows and Linux computers have typically been stuck in the role of low-powered options for thin and light machines so far, but with more and more advancements like this, maybe in a few years we could have high-end machines running ARM on those computers as well. Okay, and my second story of the week will be a ton of news around Wear OS. First, Qualcomm admitted that only 40 million Wear OS watches have shipped with Qualcomm chips since 2016. That would mean on average maybe 8 million units a year for the entire platform pretty much. And just to put into context how little that is, Apple alone has shipped almost 13 million units in just one quarter according to Counterpoint. None of the top 5 smartwatch players used Wear OS last year, which kind of explains why both Google and Qualcomm have almost forgotten about it in the past but it now looks like there will finally be a significant revival for the platform. First, Google has completely revamped the Play Store on watches, making it easier to use, as well as the Wear OS section on the Play Store on phones with better discovery and the option so users who have apps on their phones that have companion apps on the watch can finally install those right from the phone. Beside that, Qualcomm has announced that they will be launching a new Wear OS processor after ages, and they have also launched a wearables ecosystem accelerator, which is an industry alliance designed to bring together 60 different companies, although we don't actually know what exactly it will do or how it will help anyone yet. And finally, Samsung's upcoming Wear OS processor has also been leaked, which will supposedly run one and a half times faster than its last one. So it looks like after five years of Google and Qualcomm and watchmakers just sitting and like pointing fingers at each other and saying, you do the first move. No, you take the platform seriously. No, you do it. After all of that, it looks like they finally sat down and decided, okay, it's time to take this seriously. Let's work on it. Samsung will be launching their Watch 4 on the 11th of August with all of the new hardware and software. And I think that by then we will actually know if this renewed alliance has built anything meaningful or if it's just hot air after all. Okay, and my last story of this week will be the United States FTC unanimously voting to enforce new right to repair rules. This means consumers in the US who want to repair their electronics 
and cars will no longer have to worry about voiding their warranties, and there is now even debate about manufacturers being forced to release their repair schematics and allow any independent repair shop to have access to the same diagnostics tools that were usually limited to authorized ones in the past. Of course, manufacturers tried to lobby that consumers repairing their own stuff might cause them to create, I don't know, security vulnerabilities on electronics or break emission standards on cars, for example, but it's good to see that the FTC rejected most of that nonsense and it passed the rule anyway. I don't know about you, but I like the idea of owning the devices that I paid money for, and in the same way, I also really like owning the work that I created myself, which is why I got together with a bunch of other really smart YouTube creators and created Nebula. Nebula is a video streaming platform built and owned by creators like Wendover Productions, Real Engineering, Low Spec Gamer, and of course me, and we built it so it doesn't track you, it doesn't annoy you with ads, and we don't have to worry about demonetization or the algorithm hiding our stuff or any of that nonsense. My Tech Alter videos usually go up there a day or two early, and Nebula also has a ton of great originals, like long-form documentaries from Wendover Productions, a fantastic series on the logistics of D-Day by Real Engineering, and many more. Best of all, you can get access to all of Nebula for free with a subscription to my sponsor, CuriosityStream, which itself is just 15 bucks for an entire year. That's like barely more than a dollar a month. CuriosityStream is, of course, the premier place on the internet for high-quality professional documentaries from the founder of the Discovery Channel, and they have a huge library of science, nature, and history content to binge while you are stuck at home. I've recently finished watching an episode of Catalyst on CuriosityStream, which took a closer look at the potential of quantum computing, and there's lots of other great content here from hosts like David Attenborough, Jane Goodall, Stephen Hawking, and more. So check them out at the link in the description, and I'll see you next week.